History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. This is lecture 22. Freedom in Unfreedom, February 4th, 1965. I attempted the day before yesterday to convey to you something of the complexity of the debate about freedom and determinism within society as it exists at present, and to explain to you that the paradoxes of the situation have become so entangled that the very people who insist on freedom as a given of human nature generally interpret freedom as responsibility and place it in the service of repression, and the converse is equally valid. I went on to explain why the debate about freedom threatens to degenerate into ideological caprice at the very point at which it acquires genuine relevance, namely on the crucial issue of the foundations of criminal law. Perhaps I may be allowed to amplify this a little. You may be in some doubt about whether the debate about criminal law really has the relevance I have attributed to it, simply on the grounds that it raises only a few issues, and these could be said to be rather marginal. But my belief is that to think in this way is to think altogether too abstractly. This is because these marginal, marginal cases, precisely because they raise questions of ascription or responsibility, really do provide something in the nature of a touchstone, because, as in all highly individuated situations, the relationship between individual and society appears in an especially sharp focus. For that relationship can best be seen where matters become critical, where it hurts, rather than in less aggravated circumstances, or in the countless situations where things still seem more or less to function. One feature of this peculiar decline in the debates about freedom which have actually degenerated from the heights of philosophy to the level of a Weltanschauung in the course of a process that would re really repay close examination, is that the concept of freedom itself, as well as countless other concepts from the early phase of bourgeois emancipation, has an old-fashioned ring to it, something both venerable and archaic, and that, if the truth were told, people are no longer able to imagine anything specific by the idea of an appeal to freedom. I can remember very precisely at around the time when the fascist threat was becoming acute that a social democratic organization, or just a plain democratic organization, chose freedom as a slogan. At first they said free salvation, but decided that was just too silly and opted for freedom. But even freedom was laughed out of court by the Nazis, and the slogan attracted this ridicule not just for the obvious political reasons, but because the term freedom no longer possesses the power it used to have for a whole host of reasons. Chief among them was the fact of the great slump and the universal unemployment, which made a call for freedom, which implies self-determination, including economic self-determination, seemed like an unintended irony, much in the vein of the famous statement of the local Frankfurt poet Frederick Stoltz, Come to eat if you can and if the door isn't locked. In other words, freedom was exposed as the freedom to starve. People had direct experience of their dependence on society, a dependence that made a mockery of a freedom that was defined in purely formal terms. Nowadays, such experiences are no longer typical, but they survive in people's minds as possibilities and could be said to have seeped into such concepts as that of freedom. I believe, then, that if we are to update the concept, the biggest mistake we could possibly make would be to issue appeals to freedom, to popularize the idea of freedom as a slogan, or to appeal to people's autonomy. The better, the better approach would be to take the question of what has become of freedom and what threatens to become of it in the future, and to treat such questions as the precondition of any serious reflection on freedom, whereas every other attitude, such as taking freedom as a given, is to reduce it to the level of a cliché. This is not the least of the reason why I believe that the limitations on freedom and the problem of freedom should be taken so extremely seriously as I have done in these lectures up to now. And I hope that you will all understand my intentions in this regard. People who desire freedom may not appeal to it or presume it in advance, but must above all give an account of the problem of freedom whereas appeals to freedom simply because they are appeals that involve an emotive dimension contain the very aspect of heteronomy and dependency that contradicts the meaning of the word.
The entire problem of freedom as it confronts us today contains a possible paralogism. A paralogism is essentially a fallacy, though the fallacy I should like to talk about now has no direct connection with the so-called psycho psychological paralogisms you find in Kant. Dealing with the situation that most of us associate with the concept of freedom, and every such concept forms part of a constellation, always means dealing with a series of other categories with which it is intertwined. It is this that is implied in talk about concreteness. The context that has become indelibly linked with freedom is the threat of the absolute negation of freedom, which is what is evoked by the memory of the concentration camps. We might say, therefore, that there must be freedom so as to ensure that Auschwitz never happens again, simply because Auschwitz must not be allowed to happen again. I am the last person to resist the force of attempts to discover a rational formula in this argument. But if this idea really contains a fallacy that must mean that it misses its mark and would therefore fail to achieve the very thing it sets out to achieve, namely the prevention of a repetition of Auschwitz, I would, I would reply to this in the first instance by saying that if Auschwitz if Auschwitz could happen in the first place, this was probably because no real freedom existed. No freedom could be regarded as an existing reality. In other words, the misdeeds of Auschwitz were only possible, firstly, in a political system in which freedom was completely suppressed, and secondly, in a general social context that permits all that to happen, and finally, and more particularly, because the people who committed and were able to bring themselves to commit these atrocities were essentially unfree, and truly were the servants who claimed they were just carrying out orders. Unlike Heidegger, I am not in the business of language mysticism and have no desire to explore the roots of words. However, I believe that you can learn an awful lot from taking a closer look at the actual meanings of words and the ways in which language is used. The fact is that language speaks of torturers, and more specifically, the original German term Folternacht really referred to executioner's assistance. Thus, language has reserved the use of servants for torturers of all people long after society had caused or had ceased to have servants. And this shows clearly enough that we really are concerned here with the actions of unfree men. This feature surely does make its appearance in Kant's antinomian treatment of the problem of freedom. For the fact that his argument calls for an infinite re regress in order to arrive at an absolutely free ultimate cause underlying the chain of cause and effect implies that freedom is something that has not yet come into being. It means that freedom is to be treated as a possibility that has still to be implemented. No one has set about this task with as much energy as Kant himself in his resistance to the contamination of freedom with existing reality that is to say to the idea that freedom should be regarded as an immediate defining factor of reality. If you were to interpret the experiential content of Kant's doctrine of the antinomies in metaphysical terms, then what that doctrine would mean would, would be that we must abandon the illusion that freedom is a reality, so as to salvage the possibility that freedom might, once, might one day become a reality after all. The evil is not, as it must have seemed to Kant, that free human beings act in a radically evil way. But there has been a change in the sense that, since we do not yet have a world in which men no longer need to be radically evil, the spell of the unfreedom which holds them in thrall has not yet been broken. It is my belief that this is a finding that brings the executioners into the diagnosis of entanglement and guilt, and even conceives of them as victims and not just as murderers which is what they also are. I believe that only an approach of this sort would create enough breathing space to enable us to escape from the vicious circle that characterizes everything that is connected with these horrifying events and actions. I say this very cautiously and would ask you not to misunderstand me on this point. I do not have an, even the slightest intention of suggesting that reflections on freedom might provide any scope at all for evading a confrontation with such experiences that is to say, with everything that Auschwitz represents. I believe that every thought that fails to measure itself against such experiences is simply worthless, irrelevant, and utterly trivial. A human being who is not mindful at every moment of the potential for extreme horror at the present time 
must be so bemused by the veil of ideology that he might just as well stop thinking at all. However, this very situation and reflection upon the facts that are at issue forces us into a radical process of interrogation that leaves far behind us such naive questions as, are you responsible or not responsible? Freedom in the sense of moral responsibility can only exist in a free society, and a free society will have to be conceived as one which has ceased to produce people like Boger and Kadok, at least in significant numbers. I believe that their behavior consisted of acquired, internalized modes of social behavior. The term internalization, interiorization, really comes home to roost here. God knows that it would be a task worthy of criminology if only criminology were to be mindful of its proper tasks for a change. If it could demonstrate for once that, and to what extent, the utterly asocial attitudes that we encounter in such individuals are in fact social attitudes, namely the extension of the principles of a society that has really always been based on direct naked force and continues to be so based to this day. The responsibility in question amounts to something like our ability to intervene. We can only think of ourselves as responsible insofar as we are able to influence matters in the areas where we have responsibility. Everyone can learn the truth of this within his own limited sphere of activity when he perceives that there are frequently situations in which he is given responsibility for something by some institution or other, but without at the same time being given the authority to impose his will and to exercise control over what falls within his remit. This is the antinomy of authority which is caught between the twin poles of responsibility and the ability to impose one's will. It will be familiar to everyone who has been given some authority in the administered world and who occupies any position of responsibility in it. I would say that this is the antinomy par excellence and it gives everyone who has experienced it something of an insight into the tangled nature of the real world. Responsibility, then, is the touchstone by which freedom can be measured in reality, by which freedom can be imputed, as the lawyers put it. But if responsibility truly is the critical zone of freedom, we must say that today there is a complete mismatch between responsibility and influence, not merely in so-called official circles with regard to people who have authority to issue directives in a particular defined area, but who then, for a hundred different reasons, issue instructions that do not reflect their own understanding, or do so only to a very limited degree. But over and above this, there is the so-called sovereign nation, in other words, the people who cast their vote in the polling booths in order to determine their political and social destiny. These people have neither objectively nor subjectively the possibility and influence needed to ensure that their actions will shape the world as they would like it to be. These things have been said so often that I have no need to repeat them here. I would remind you only of the controversy that arose in connection with Niemöller, who described the situation with a quite extraordinary integrity and frankness. I mention it only because it enables you to understand an insight we owe to Hegel. This, this is that, while freedom appears to us as a subjective quality, as if the judgment about whether freedom exists is one that falls exclusively to the subjective mind. This insight enables us to see how dependent freedom is on objective realities and to gauge the extent to which we are capable of influencing the real world with its overpowering, structured institutions by what we do as formerly free, subjective agents. It is only in this context that I wish to invoke all the assertions that have been made about the decline of the political process and the political impotence of individuals, assertions that are familiar to you all and about which a, a very large and very spirited literature has grown up in the meantime. What I wish to emphasize is something that each of you has experienced in all its subtleties in your awareness of the excessive demands made on you, and probably on everyone without exception, even if we ignore such matters as people's class membership. It is the experience that more is constantly demanded of you than you can possibly achieve. This is a highly paradoxical situation if I am right in assuming its general prevalence, and I would ask you to consider whether there is any truth in what I am claiming here. It is a very curious fact that we constantly feel that excessive demands are being made on us, even though advances in technology have rendered such vast amounts of work superfluous that we ought all to find things a whole lot easier 
and the difference between what social norms expect of us and what we are capable of achieving ought to be shrinking all the time, or even leaving us in credit on the subjective side. But there's no question of that happening. If I am not mistaken, I do not wish to exaggerate this, but my belief is that we all feel under constant pressure. This feeling is not a matter of particular causes. By this I mean that it is not so much the fact that many of you feel you have to learn too many things for your examinations, or that I feel too many demands are being made of me in the sense that I have to perform too many administrative duties, and that these keep me from that, from what I regard as my most important tasks, tasks I can find time for only by stealing time from unavoidable chores, so that I have to do countless jobs that others could do just as well as I, or even better. All these things are probably no more than a cover for the fact that we live in a society based on formal freedom, and in return for this formal freedom, it demands that we wholeheartedly devote our efforts to whatever has fallen to our lot, while at the same time preventing us from doing so because of the overwhelming power of its institutions and the overwhelming power with which it confronts us at every moment. This, I would say, is the concrete form in which we experience the question of freedom and unfreedom today. I hope that someone will one day decide that this phenomenon of excessive demands might be worthy of serious analysis. What marks out this feeling of chronic overwork is that it always contains, in a concealed form of course, something like a memory of freedom. That is to say, unless we felt that we ought by rights to be free, that we ought as free persons to be able to cope with all the demands that have been made, we would not have this chronic feeling of being overstretched, a feeling that is undoubtedly far keener than the feeling of care, and similar ideas that the existentialists tell us about. The term excessive demands, incidentally, is one that has only come into general use in our own day. It may have occurred in the period before Hitler, but only in specific situations where you could say that this person or that was having too many demands made on him, but the general socialization of the term excessive demands that one encounters today is, un is undoubtedly to be laid at the door of the present situation. We should make one further point, namely that it quickly results in a vicious circle. The fact that every individual feels excessive demands are being made on him, the fact that every individual discovers that his so-called, i.e. formal freedom and responsibility, constantly impose demands upon him that he is unable to meet, and that we feel the whole time that we are bound to fail because of objective circumstances. All this leads to a kind of resignation and indifference, which, if anything, only encourages our acquiescence and what is imposed on us from outside, and the shoulder-shrugging indifference to everything associated with the concept of freedom. If what I have attempted to explain to you has any truth in it, this means, and I should like to emphasize this, that evil, unfreedom, is not to be found where old metaphysicians of the satanic looked for it, namely in the idea that some people use their freedom of choice to choose evil. We should include the philosophy of history here since we are talking about the theory of history and freedom, but in all probability, and especially where the social trend, that is to say the total process of socialization, is furthest advanced, we should say that one of the relevant factors here is that wicked people of the kind you meet in literature no longer exist. Iago, say, or Richard III, to name only the most famous literary prototypes. Such radically evil people are no longer to be found, for the radical evil of the kind postulated by Kant presupposes a strength of character, energy, and a substantiality of the self that is made impossible by a world that calls for more or less dissociated achievements that are separated from the self. It is a world in which I almost wish to say that not even a wicked man can survive. It may seem a consolation that utterly evil people are perhaps no longer to be found, any more than I would suppose that there are any misers left. But any such consoling thought will be cancelled out by the corollary that it has also become impossible to imagine really good people. In the bourgeois age, an independent merchant would show some generosity to every beggar who crossed his path. But in these busy, tangled times, good men have become just as unimaginable as truly evil ones. This brings us to a point which I had believed would be at the center of the clutch of problems that I have been presenting to you in these lectures. I believe that I have not just shown you that the content of the moral principle, the categorical imperative, constantly changes as history changes. This is a bit of a truism that I would be a little embarrassed to have told you about,
but also we have approached a threshold at which we must ask whether the entire moral sphere, not just the good, not just what can be thought of as good, whether the entire sphere in which it is meaningful to speak of good and evil has not approached a threshold at which it is no longer meaningful to apply these terms. If that were the case, it would undoubtedly help to explain some some of the antinomies and aporias that we constantly encounter in discussions of Auschwitz. One such is that here we necessarily apply yardsticks of good and evil to behavior that, as if in fulfillment of a dreadful prophecy, already belongs to a state of mankind in which, negatively, the entire sphere of morality has been abolished, instead of being elevated positively into a higher sphere that is equally free of both repression and morality. Let me add or remind you that freedom and unfreedom are not primary phenomena, but derivatives of a totality that at any given time exercises dominion over individuals. If I may take up this dialectical idea to which I have ventured forward and pursue it a little further, back in the opposite direction, what I have told you about the obsolescence of our categories of morality and the terrible threat of the aging of good and evil that is a kind of infernal reflection of the utopia of which Nietzsche had dreamt, all that has its prehistory. It is not something that that has just appeared out of the blue. It is a product of history in the sense that the categories of freedom and unfreedom are themselves the products of history, and in the sense that the entire sphere of morality only came into being historically together with the human subject. If we consider the amorality of the world of myth, we can see that what matters is not the idea that people used to have different ideas about morality. That is the kind of claim made by trivial popular psychology and the like, but that at that time, thanks to the global situation of the human species and the stage of development development reached by human society, the entire sphere of a stable, self-contained, and responsible subjectivity had not yet emerged. Therefore, there was nothing to which moral categories might have been applied. On the other hand, we cannot simply deny the existence of a separation, a historically caused separation of individual and society which ultimately led to the problem of individual freedom. The fact that a gulf has opened up between individual and society is not only, and this is something that must be emphasized, particularly nowadays, is not only the negative phenomenon it has been misrepresented as, above all by the Romantic movement, as well as a host of stale ideologies and recycled versions of Romanticism. It is not merely the negative side of that loss of unity, meaning, and the feeling of safety, that Balnow likes to talk about, and all those supposedly lovely things. But Hegel, slightly, but Hegel rightly perceived, and it is perhaps one of the most brilliant achievements of the phenomenology of spirit, particularly the middle sections, in which he deals with all the topics we are speaking about here, that the rift between individual and society is a necessary element of the emancipation of the individual. Without this rift, the idea of freedom which points the way beyond both this rupture and the undifferentiated state of affairs would be inconceivable. At this point, we come very close to, what shall we call it, the Gnostic antinomian implications of dialectical thought. Without evil, that is to say, without that modern term of abuse, alienation, which has acquired such an alarming degree of popularity nowadays, there would be no good without this rift to provide mankind with its substantive security within a given society, the idea of freedom, and with it the idea of a condition worthy of human beings would not exist. This insight is swiftly joined by the suspicion that what were said, what were said even in Hegel, to be substantial ages in which the individual lived in harmony with the collective of which he was a member, were in reality far from from providing these settings for a happy and harmonious existence. More likely, they were ages characterized by a repressiveness that was so powerful that what has come down to us from them is merely the end result, namely the triumph of the universal, without our being able to give an account of the excesses of suffering and injustice, without which these so-called meaningful times, as Lucas once called them, rather romantically in his youth, would not have existed. We may be quite safe in stating that the self naively immersed in the so-called substantial society would have found the distinction between freedom and unfreedom entirely alien, And in this way, the link between history and the question of freedom must be seen to be more than a matter simply of an ever-changing content.
The link between the two must lie instead in the constitution of the problem of freedom itself. If that is true, and if the alternative between freedom and unfreedom is alien to that individual, not just at the level of reflection, but also in his entire mode of behavior as he naively and directly obeys the rules of the universal, then we must conclude that this allegedly happy time before the divorce between freedom and unfreedom had taken place can only have been an unfree condition for the individuals who were born into it.